thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be doing a panel right now um, on startups. Um, so our moderator today is Mayank. Um, we also have Abdul, raise your hand. Uh, we have Ramja, Nikunj, Karina, and David. Thank you so much for joining. I'm sure you can, if you want to run through um, and just give a brief intro. Sure. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Hey guys, um, thanks again for joining. Um, my name is Maya Mathur. Um, I'm part of the SAP's Startup Focus Program, sitting in uh, uh, Building 2. Uh, been with SAP for about 16 years now. And uh, you know, today we have the great opportunity. We have about four of our startups from our program. Um, we're going to talk about one, what they do, and also we'll have Abdul uh, guide us through what SAP's digital transformation actually means. Um, in the context of design thinking, and also what is in it for partners and startups like uh, these uh, to take advantage of, of what we mean and uh, do with digital transformation. So, uh, with that, um, you know, very quickly as the introduction went through, we have Abdul, a senior director of strategy and go to market, Karina, um, UX design lead for a startup called Blipper. We have Mikunj, uh, founder and CEO, uh, CEO of a startup called Falcon Green. Uh, we have David King, CEO of Foghorn, Rajan Das, uh, founder director of Lean Access. <coughs> so guys, um, as you can see, it's like informal audience, we kind of keep it flowing. But mainly, uh, you know, just to get through a few things, uh, what we could start off uh, with the startups, with just a brief intro about you, your company, what exactly it does, and then we can drive down a bit deeper into uh, the digital transformation topic as well. So, uh, Thanks for the invitation to come here on this panel. Um, so I have a very simple question to ask. Besides voice, images, video, what do you think is the most prevalent type of data used in business? Well, guess what? One of them is the operations data that is produced on a continuous basis, whether it's in data centers, in plants, in the uh, business systems that are, be, that are being used by people. And so Falconry is designed to create a cognitive assistant for people who run operations to understand what their data is capturing. And we translate for them, essentially like CaptionBot translates videos into plain text. We do the same thing with the operations data to produce plain text understanding of what's happening to people's systems in operation. Thanks. So Foghorn um, is in the Fog computing space, which is a term invented about four or five years back by Cisco uh, to basically connote a layer of compute closer to the ground, if you will. So a lot of the big data analytics, machine learning, uh, that's you know, been uh, the focus of technology development for the last decade has all been centered around the cloud, kind of a centralized uh, data, data lake or a data store where all the intelligence can be applied. So Foghorn's focus has been to develop a complementary layer at the edge, if you will, closer to the source of machine data. So our whole goal, like Falconry, is to be able to bring the power of IoT closer to the, uh, to the ground, if you will, closer to the edge, by developing this very advanced um, compute layer where you can perform uh, high-speed data analytics and real-time machine learning on the data stream itself. And it has you know, great utility in the industrial space. Uh, anything that has high data ingestion, right, so big machines, or processes you know, like cars, uh, like transportation systems, uh, you know, manufacturing environments, uh, mining, oil and gas. Any place you have you know, the ability to generate terabytes if not petabytes of data a day, you need something to process that data and apply intelligence without sending it all to the cloud. That's what the company does. We're about two years old now. Uh, I joined about six months back. We're just completing a Series A round of funding. And uh, we've got about 25 people and we're looking to hire another 25 almost all in development, and particularly in the UI, UX area, which is why this event is of uh, great interest to us. Hi, I'm Karina, and I'm the UX lead for Blipper. Blipper is a augmented reality company that is building an AR platform, and we focus on visual discovery and image recognition, um, interesting things such as having a creation tool for um, AR content creation. So there's a lot of interesting things going on, and we're not exactly competing in the space where everyone is working on the hardware. We're focusing on building an AR ecosystem. So how do we see information translate to become narrative, and how do we tell that story and capture those user journey as data? Um, this is something that we'll, we're, we're looking at as well. 
So working on that um, visual discovery, this is uh, kind of a, a new direction that we're taking on. And augmented reality is really a space that um, every, everyone has been talking about. But the company has been around for five years. We have about 200 people right now. Thank you. My name is Ranjan Chaudhary. Uh, I'm the founding director of Lean Access. Uh, we do what we call Lean Supply Chain. How many of us understand here what a supply chain is? Oh, oh, supply chain is where SAP kind of is strong at. So as you know, in today's context, uh, when the products are getting more and more customized, you know, you can't sell the same cell phones to everybody today. Each and every feature of cell phone now is pretty much user specific, right? And even the products are now, the, the lifetime of product is getting shortened more and more, right? So it's getting, it's, it's getting harder and harder for enterprises to do forecasting. And guess what? All the supply chain management solutions today is all about forecast, produce, and push. And that's what is not working. That's exactly what we do. We are trying to find a white space. There are tons of solutions in SAP itself, and there are many vendors outside. But there's none who can actually plan a supply chain which is completely independent of forecast and still meet the customer service. That's what we do. We call it as lean supply chain. Uh, we have uh, 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 on-demand uh, uh, custom algorithms, which is more to uh, more tuned to. If you, if you remember uh, uh, Toyota's uh, lean systems, so some of those algorithms is what we have gotten. In fact, Hana gives us the speed. So now we have something which is completely independent of forecast, and we can actually meet service levels, which is actually better than most of those forecast driven systems because forecast is is not working that's what we have thank you great um thank you good afternoon everyone uh, my name is abdul i'm part of the strategy and go-to-market team here at sap uh, so i have been brought in here to give you some context around uh, on what is going on because i think the theme here is digital transformation in the iot space and the stuff that we do um, at sap um, and you hear about all of these great technologies that are coming through and the great innovations. Uh, SAP was also a great feature functionality company. It still is. Uh, but I wanted to kind of put a spin on this with regards to design and design thinking because what's happened over a due course of time um, in the recent past is SAP has kind of gone from feature functionality to an experience focus and user focused companies. And as you hear all about all of these great stories and great innovations from our partners here from the Startup Focus program, I'd like you to kind of keep an eye out and keep a lens on, on bo boiling this down to the end user experience and having making sure that all of these great technology, technology is only great as many people use it and the adoption increases. And we talk about this IoT story where you know it's about the atoms to bits um, you know, your refrigerator getting smarter and telling you it's running out of eggs or milk or whatever else that might be, or, you know, the sensor technology all over the place. When you bring that in and ground that in end user experience and have a compelling end user experience for the customer, that's what increases adoption. Because in the past, I, I, I'll be the first one to admit SAP software had a lot to be desired from an end user experience standpoint. We always were great in the feature functionality checklist. We always would check all the boxes. We would have everything available probably in the same screen. But now when you hear about the great innovation, and there's a lot of parallels here from what SAP went through in the past, where great technology came in, but not necessarily the great experience for the end users, we want to kind of bring that uh, to the fore in this context. So if you would keep the mic with you, um, just one data point for the audience here. Each of these startups were part of the Startup Focus program. One of the requirements to be part of the program is to actually build on top of SAP HANA. So each of their solutions um, have a part, or in some cases at the end to end solutions running on uh, not only SAP HANA as a platform, but also deployed on HANA Cloud platform uh, from a consumer's point of view. So that is an important piece to know. So Abul, uh, you know, building up on the point that you just uh, mentioned, what's the advice for these startups, and you know, not just startups, but for the partners as such, to work with us in the context of design thinking and towards achieving that milestone that we want to get to in terms of digital transformation in IoT. 
Any piece of advice what you could give to these guys too? Yeah, so if you look at the IoT space itself, there are, you know, you can break it down to maybe four big um, revenue streams or business models if you want to look at it. The first one would be the endpoint. So it would be the hardware piece where there would be the sensors that are actually beaming out the information to uh, a place where, where you, and SAP pays less in that space, but if you're going to take that as one piece. The second piece would be the APIs and services on top of the data that is coming on, on or being uploaded by the hardware system. The third piece would be to actually take, there's data everywhere, and data is being generated at a ridiculous pace at this point in time. And so the signal to noise ratio is insane. For you to extract actionable and relevant data out of all of these things that are being beamed out for, from every single sensor that is out there in the market, it's going to be a huge challenge. And for you to actually have that service available, have that intelligence, machine learning, all of the great things that, all of the buzzwords that we hear in the valley, all that being available for you as a service would be something that, that SAP would play in. And the last thing would be that all of this cannot be done on your own. Eventually, and SAP has done this in the past as well, right? we've gone with a platform approach where you have a infrastructure layer and a services layer, but eventually business expertise and subject matter expertise has come with our partners. So everybody can build an ecosystem of uh, relationships and bring that into the fore in the IoT space specifically. So to, to your specific question on how design and design thinking would, would play into this, and you play into all four of these revenue streams, you know, SAP has a footprint to play here, but all of our investments and all of our experiences are going forward and in the recent past has been in partnership with our end users and in close partnership and in close engagement with them and understanding the end user needs, performing ethnographic studies on uh, you know, what, is, what is it that the end user encounters in their day-to-day -day life and what is the major pain points, bottlenecks that they have to go through and, and address that specific pace. Uh, if, We've, we've been in this, we've been falling into the trap of you know, building one, one size fits all solution. And that not necessarily is not the case anymore, where you know, end users will have specific needs, they perform specific tasks at a specific uh, point in time, and you want to actually adapt to that, as opposed to you know, just directing them that this is the piece of software that we believe is the greatest and, uh, latest and greatest, and we know better than you, go ahead and use it. That's a force function rather than you know, go starting from the end user and asking them what is it that you're going through in your day-to-day -day life and gave us the input so that we can build our experiences. So end user empathy is the key to everything and that's what we preach here with regards to design, design thinking. You know, having that conversation with your end users and, and ha helping them give you that feedback will allow you to actually build that better product. And there is no end state for the product. Eventually when you build a version of the product, you're gonna build a second version very soon and a second version very soon. And this iterative release process that you will go through uh, which will which will be better and more productive if you do it with your end users. So that would be my yeah. thanks. So I'm going to take my SAP employee hat off and yeah. be on side of the startups. Having worked with these startups for the last three years, we've come across startups for who design thinking is not a priority because they want to get something else done. Their priorities are different. A small team funding is an issue. So I guess the question to you guys is that one. Was this of importance to you in your life as a startup, you know, the design thinking team itself? And how important is it now where you are today in your respective interactions with the customers and where your product is today? And relate back to, had you, would you have done this if you had not done? And again, to emphasize the point that how important is it, uh, like, for example, Ranjit said in a supply chain, which is traditional in SAP, bunch of not so nice goodies, uh, we folks here, but, or we have somebody like Blipper who is this front end facing mobile application. So please help us give some perspective as to how important and not important has been for you. So yeah, um, see, uh, as a supply chain and, and as uh, my hand said correctly, this is one of the traditional, uh, you know, the, the, the software or application that we see in enterprises. When we started, of course, we wanted the functionality. As, as I said, we, we have a, a way of doing things which completely contradicts the way it is done today. People do forecasting and then produce and then push, and we are saying, hey, forget forecasting, you cannot do it. And the, the logic is ignore forecast, produce, or come up with an inventory levels which is just enough for you to service your customers. Now, it is an algorithm which we wanted to prove, and that is where we started from. 
So from our perspective, I don't think the UX per se has played as much of a role today. But when we go to the customer, that is the first thing they see. And that is one of the first things that we are actually right now as we speak. That is my prime, uh, or rather number one priority to get the, get the look and feel of the product you know, more usable and not look like any other, you know, many other solutions we have from in this space, right? So I want to I want to um, talk on top of what Abdul was talking about. It's it's it is, it is a very challenging space for Flipper because we we're in the emerging technology and we don't really have a user base. We don't know who these users are. We don't even know if the public really understands augmented reality and what that means to them. That term really just come up in the last couple months, and. Even though it sounds like we have been do doing UX for a long time, we've been doing design for a long time, but not really UX. So it just really started to happen. And UX in, in a sense that it doesn't just only affect the product itself, but also affect the product vision and the roadmap. And when we have a certain vision that the leadership team has, we want to release some kind of product really fast to the market and see if that works. Um, Sometimes it's not exactly where we want it to be, but we just, I think in the Silicon Valley, is really about speed. Um, we release something out and see the response of the public, and that will help us to pivot. And after a number of times, we just we can be completely derailed from what we think the product could be. And this is really interesting, because when you put UX into play in, in this kind of a business direction role, it can really significantly change the business in a, in a very interesting way. I also want to pick up on Abdul's comment. When I started running companies in the Valley, you know, 20, 20 plus years ago now, he's exactly right. UI, UX was not, uh, UX wasn't even talked about. UI wasn't really focused on, right? So it really was about feature function. Can you do the job? Can you do ERP? Can you do CRM? You know, networking, you know, can you get the bits across the network? You know, security, you know, you know can you you know, at least show me where the threat is? So things have really dramatically changed. And I think we've seen in the Valley over the last 20 years, huge importance placed on UI UX. I mean, startups, frankly, that have similar functionality but have better you know, user interfaces tend to do better, right? The outcomes tend to be much bigger. So it's really accelerated, I think, for startups the need to focus on this early. So even in our space, which is, you know, you think very prosaic, this is industrial data, you know, OT data, sitting on servers that you know, have never been looked at for 20 years, right? This is, you know, temperature, pressure data that gets you know, gathered, you know, five times a second, nobody ever looks at it. Well, reality is that as you start to try to make that data useful, right, you're immediately confronted with you know, people that are going to look at an interface and say, what am I supposed to do with that data? So from day one, actually, we're on our third version. We're only a couple years in about to launch our commercial product. on the third version of our UI because we realize every use case we go into, every customer that touches our system immediately has a reaction. They want to see a great visualization, right? So visualization and workflow are absolutely paramount in our system because there's a tremendous amount of data that we're trying to sift through, you know, provide analytics and new machine learning uh, algorithms to. So we need that experience to be something that is the equal of the technology platform we're building. So we are heavily focused on, on UI, UX already. Uh, we're also working with a lot of big partners that are also some of our funding sources like GE and Bosch and, and others that are big players in the industrial space. And even those players, you've probably seen the ads for Pritix and GE's, you know, overarching vision of, of industrial IoT, huge amount of their efforts also going into UI UX. So our components need to work with theirs. Uh, our brand product obviously needs to stand alone as well. So there's a, you know, I would say, you know, where maybe 20 years ago you might have 5% of your team, you know, focused on UI UX. We have, you know, probably double, triple that today, even as a startup. So um, I'm going to take a slightly controversial position here. How many people here would agree with me if I say we've reached peak visual recognition? You know what is peak oil, right? We reached peak oil potentially three years ago. So my position is that we've reached peak visual, visual recognition. And I say that because there are certain limits to our cognitive abilities. I also say that because the volume of data and the rate at which growth of data has occurred has surpassed anything anybody has seen in the course of history. It's not just in my life. Um, and we are seeing that people break down when they're put under that much cognitive load. So a data science visualization that is sophisticated might be very cool, might be very attractive, but it's not practical. And as a result, 
um, when we started Falcon we had realized that we were solving a cognitive problem. And a cognitive problem naturally is one that is very liberative. And just like what we saw with Alexa in terms of translating speech to text. Every cognitive problem is human intensive. So the one element as a very lean, poorly funded startup, we could not make a compromise on was on design. And design from the perspective of being able to connect with the user in terms of the problem that falconry solves in a way that is incontrovertible, in a way that is an unforgettable experience, and in a way that the key metaphor of what falconry stands for can be brought up. We did not focus on tasks. We did not do any ethnographic studies. We had to go by our intuition for what is the problem that falconry has arisen for. And so a lot of times the challenge with uh, UX design is that it requires a lot of inputs. And as a startup, you just don't have the luxury of collecting that many inputs. So you have to have a good place to start from an intuition perspective. But we still do think, and we get compliments every time we show it to a customer, that this is the only simplified time series analytics technology they've ever seen. Now, it's compliment. It's not something we set out to achieve, but we feel it would be very hard for us to make progress commercially unless people thought that way about us. Pablo, uh, this one for you. Um, this year, Sapphire um, has, I think, somewhere in the middle or in the beginning, as he started his, his usual um, uh, speech, was if the response time of a particular application is not instant, I mean, he said instant is two minutes or less, or, or sorry, uh, seconds or, or less, you're going to move, you're going to move away. Uh, it, it's kind of a reaction that my four-year-old does when he doesn't get something right away. And in the context of the millennial approach of um, the user behavior with our social analytic, uh, social um, applications and uh, you know, what's going on in social networking, the question here is that how do you apply that kind of a concept with what's going on in the outside world to the SAP world? And any perspective of how we as SAP is approaching this problem and how we intend to address this problem? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's no doubt in the fact that we are getting to goldfish attention spans at this point in time. We don't have, um, we don't have patience to wait uh, even if it's life-changing data that you're waiting for, you cannot wait for longer than three seconds. Um, and that's that's a benchmark that's been just set. Um, and you can argue that till the cows come home, that's not going to change. Uh, so the only challenge here would be to actually kind of keep up with it and compete with the... So because there are enough, there's enough data mines out there. If you look at Facebook and if you see the amount of data that is flowing in into that system every minute, and you still see sub-second response times on your iPhones or whatever else that might be, and not even in an LTE connection, like a 2G, 3G connection spot, there is optimizations that have already been made. So it's about kind of prioritizing what the end user would like to see and should see, uh, and having that be available. And always, if they're willing to wait longer, or if they get the teaser and they know that there's more in there that they'd like to see um, in due course of time, then you kind of have an experience where you click on it and you are willing, when you click on it, you make a, an outward and an overt uh, uh, intention of waiting for the next three to five seconds to see that information, but not up, up front. So what you have to do is to kind of look at designing your system in certain ways. When you have these benchmarks being set by the social media and the millennials and, and the users, the current group of users that are coming into the system, you want to look at it from that perspective as well. Kind of designing your system and designing your experience for the lowest common denominator. If the denominator is two seconds, so be it. And you kind of work your way upwards from there. Uh, but regardless, you cannot compromise on the quality and the integrity of the data, right? So whatever you see, especially in the IoT space, especially if you're looking at the enterprise software piece, you have to have something that's actionable. It just cannot be a pretty looking chart with a bar graph or a pie graph. You have to look at it from what does the end user use and in having those interactions with customers and having that intuition to Nick this point. To, to have that you know, confidence in, in your system and your availability and, and the process that you have built in the infrastructure on the back end, uh, that will actually help you bring that to the fore. So that's the way it should happen. A question again back to the startups. Um, you're here because you're trying to work and align with a big name company like SAP. 
and yet you are here trying to do your own thing and adapt um, and change as per the market requirement. The question to you is that how do you how do you internally when you go back to your office how do you internally keep pace with with trying to align with SAP or maybe any other bigger company and at the same time align with the changing industry trends because I'm moving at a different pace but yet you have to be at the same spot at the same time. So in other words is that you you know being a small team, how do you internally manage and keep the pace uh, going? <laughs> it's really hard, and, and let me give you my background. We are five people company, and we are six months old. And in fact, before I came to this conference, I did talk to Abdul and, and a few others that my biggest challenge today is you guys are running at 120 miles an hour, and I only have five people, and half of them are actually business people, right? They don't understand half the things that are being talked about here, including myself. So what do we do? So a lot of these. Uh, UX and, and look and feel and all that good stuff that you guys are talking about, you've got to make it available in your own product. And let me give you an example. I did share with some people. Uh, we use dashboarding. I mean, this is a tool that we present to all the CXOs and so on and so forth. Now, you don't expect us to go and tweak around each and every dashboard. We expect a lot of these tweaking and expanding and drilling and all that touch and all that good stuff. I expect as part of some of these technologies that we use from SAP, right? We don't have uh, bandwidth. Even if we go out and try to find out people to hire for a short period of time, we don't have. In fact, we are talking about the integration technology, HCI, right? All this while, we have grown up using things like, you know, the PI and XI and all those good stuff which has been around with SAP, and therefore, when I go out, those are the skill sets that we get. We don't get HCI. Today I need as you know people who can help us integrate our HANA Cloud platform with ERP systems, S4 HANA and so on and so forth. I don't have these skills. So it is a challenging and I don't think I have an answer as a small company. I think it's just that I make a call to my own uh, and you know try to find out, hey, can you connect me to someone? I go to SCN and accidentally find out that all these technologies that I used is no more going to be supported going forward. And so on and so forth. I mean, it, it is a challenge. And I have discussed this in various forums that in somehow we have to be integrated more closely with SAP in some fashion, which is beyond just a few training videos and, and SCNs and so on and so forth. Otherwise, it's, it's kind of hard. I mean, I don't think, even if we can do some of these, or even if we can work with these technologies, I'm not sure if I'm making optimum use of this. And that's not good. I think Blipper is in a better situation in the sense that we're so much more established and that we do have our own direction that we're not really dependent on partners. Um, we have SAP, we have education, we have small businesses, we have a lot of different partners that we work with and our product direction is very clear and I think when we started, um, we started to work towards that direction first and then when we see opportunity that's when we collaborate with SAP and say hey maybe we can help you guys with the pre transactional experience base because we can we can provide you with some customer insights that and give you data that other companies don't have so we do have that leverage um, so I don't think it's a fair question for, for me compared to the rest of the panelists here I think Foghorn is somewhere in the middle of these two um, in the sense that we've got a little more mature, a little more scale, but not 200 people. But if you think about you know, our commonality with SAP, it's primarily focused at the customer level. The same customers in ERP, you know, the, a lot of them were the big manufacturing industrial customers that get SAP at start. And that's really kind of the end focus of our, you know, of our applications, our technology. So as a software only you know, edge platform provider, we by definition have to basically be a partner enabler, right? So we already have a half dozen industrial partners like GE and Bosch and Schneider and Siemens, et cetera, where we're literally integrating our components into their end-to-end -end solution. We also have about a half dozen IoT gateway partners, the Cisco, the Dell, the HPEs of the world, Intel's of the world. We have you know, a half dozen of the big uh, systems integrators, the Deloitte's, the Accenture's, the TCS's of the world. We also have a number of cloud platform, uh, you know, uh, cloud infrastructure providers like uh, Hunt Cloud Platform and, and others that are built more around the Hadoop Spark world. So we've already got the challenge from 
the business development standpoint, building our go-to-market, we're going to hire up a big business development team and a huge you know, systems engineer and FAE team long before we hire end user salespeople. Uh, because you know our solution has to be part of an end-to-end. -end. And by painting the picture for a future, uh, painting the picture for a future that perhaps will take SAP longer but a startup less time, you're doing a service to the start effectively because you're raising the bar higher for everybody that might be entering this space. Um, second uh, thought I have is that um, naturally the SAP ecosystem is, uh, is like an industrial ecosystem where various people play on their strengths, realize their limitations, and work with each other to help the industrial customer or the enterprise customer address the needs of their end users and customers. And so one of the things we've learned sort of as the as, as a well-meaning big brother from SAP is that you've got to be open to understanding that there is another perspective with who you may not necessarily agree, but that is a part of the conversation, number one. And number two, that you've learned, that you have to learn to be a good player in that ecosystem. Certainly, you're going to look out for yourself, but you also have to do it in such a way that you're not going to come across as a mean player, as a bully, as potentially a reckless person in that environment. And we think that more so than in any other world, in the B2B enterprise, industrial IoT, all of these worlds, everybody's looking for the right set of partners to work with. Chemistry plays a very big role. And we believe learning how to be part of an ecosystem that is this large, that also moves at variable paces depending on who you are, you learn how to be a good player in that ecosystem. We have one more set of code. Um, last question and then we open up for a QA. and a um, We've seen the past several articles and here in the Bay Area from the VC community, investment community, startup ecosystem, man, this is a bubble that's gonna burst. India and other regions are already exploding in terms of too many startups, very little success stories, unless you are in those top two or three unicorns. Firstly, do you agree with that this is a bubble? And secondly, what does success mean to you? Is it the next investment? Is it the exit? So just very quick thoughts. Yeah. Um, actually, I'll say that as a startup, you would like it to be a bubble and to for yourself to be an exception so that you can have all the meaningless competition disappear from the field. Um, I do feel that as an entrepreneur and one that tries to raise funds from time to time, uh, there is a fair amount of uh, uh, reluctance to part with money, knowing that this might just be vaporware. And it helps when something you're solving is truly uh, revolutionary and transformative. So for those kind of companies that are able to uh, work in a lean manner, that focus on revenue, engagement, and customer success. I think this is a terrific environment. So it is one thing to say whether or not it's a bubble. It's another thing to say whether or not this is a good environment for startups. Thanks. Thanks. Having uh, run a public company in 2000 and then my, uh, my own startup back in 2008, uh, you know, I've been through a couple of these. And I would tell you that there's, there's clearly a bubble in valuation of certain you know, unicorns, private companies that got you know, wake where the the supply of money we exceeded the uh, kind of the rational thinking around valuation. But having said that, I don't think this is at all like the financial crisis of 2008 where the entire economy kind of took a big ratchet back. And it's certainly not like the exuberance of 2000, 2001 where valuation metrics were completely thrown out the window, right? So now the businesses really do have, you know, revenue models. They do have, you know, not necessarily earnings, but they at least have, you know, customer base, not just eyeballs or impressions or something that's meaningless. So I do think it's a different, yeah, I do, there's a lots of funding, um, as our recent round proved. You know, we had one financial sponsor, but we had a half dozen strategic lined up to participate. So the sources of capital are different. There is a lot of capital on corporate balance sheets. There's still a lot of venture money out there. It tends to be more concentrated in kind of the top funds, if you will, and a lot of the more marginal funds have disappeared. But there's still a lot of capital out there. So I would argue that it's, it's not a bubble in the same way the 2000, 2008 were bubbles. But you're clearly going to see a rationing back. You'll see some down rounds. You'll see IPOs like you know, Twilio and others that will be at the same level or below the last round. You'll see an acquisition of Jasper by Cisco, which was at the same round as the last valuation. Those kind of things will happen just because the valuations got too extreme for a certain small subset of companies. I can only speak directly to the augmented reality domain. Is AR a bubble? 
in a sense, I think it is when you're seeing all these gimmicky interaction experience that, oh, it looks really cool on my app and that's it. Um, what we're moving towards is beyond the brand and advertisement and Blipper is moving towards making this gimmicky experience into something more utilitarian, making information more narrative and more poetic and having data to track them. And I think if we were to be able to crack that thing, that would not be a bubble that we're living in. And I think that's something that we can influence in the industry. And I think um, for a lot of startups, that's something that we're trying to do is not just to follow the trend, but how do you influence the market with your, with your vision and capability? And how do you pivot with the market? So I, I, I can only speak of for supply chain, right? I mean, supply chain space is so dated that I think it has already withered all the problems and so on and so forth. I don't think there are any more problems <laughs> left there. But having said that, I don't think the problem is solved. I don't think the problem is the same. I think everybody, every enterprise customer that I talk to, every supply chain manager, every CEO that I talk to, supply chain is still the biggest problem they have. And the reason I just explained, I mean, the things are changing way too fast. So I don't think there is a bubble. In fact, uh, SAP itself is investing in uh, products like IBP and so on and so forth because the same problem needs to be solved in a different fashion. And I think that's where we are trying to create our own space. Thank you. Just, just to add perspective, I know I'm not part of the startups here, but you know, um, just that I spend a lot of time with the VCs and and. Uh, spend some time at Sapphire as well, but there's always a great time to do startups, there's always a bad time to do startups. Uh, and especially if you're in the valley here, you know, if you have the right idea, you have the conviction in, in what you're trying to do and what you're trying to bring uh, to the table, um, no amount of bubble, no amount of overvaluation is going to, you know, scare you away from, from doing the right thing and, and doing what you believe in. I, I truly believe and, you know, kudos to all the people here on the panel, they've kind of gone with it and, and stuck to their passion and their work. Um, but just to add a little bit of a data point, because I'm biased and I always put my design hat on and the time that I spend with VCs, you know, uh, the more VCs are now kind of looking at more data points, not just, you know, because it's free revenue, because there are many other things, there are many variables in the play, uh, you know, having attention to detail and design, design co-founders, these are data points that VCs are looking at at this point in time and they're looking at, you know, funding startups. I'm not saying that that's a general blanket rule that applies, but it is something that, that has emerged over over the distance, over a period of time. And that's something that we need to consider as well as being part of the design community and the design thinking community to look at, you know, giving that compelling experience for the end user and taking that key takeaway um, and having that. And, you know, regardless of what the bubble is, if you're va adding value to your end user, I think it's, it's always going to be making a difference. Great point. Um, we open up for Q&A. Any question to the startups, to Abdul? Great. Um, if not, again, thanks very much to the audience. Thanks very much to the start of the panelists for making time to come in here today. Uh, thank you, Abdul, and great. See you guys later.